So I'll be talking about a new survey project that I've been doing with um, Joel King Sauber. We've been doing both field and lab based resurveys of high altitude coleus butterflies. And a lot of this resampling goes back to Joel's graduate work. You can see him there as a graduate student collecting butterflies. This is not working. Um, so we've been quite interested in interacting responses to climate change. So we can imagine a phenotype that's optimally suited for a given environment. We then might have some sort of environmental change that shifts along the environment axis. And then we can imagine that the optimal phenotype falls to a new level. So we can think about the different options organisms have in realigning the phenotype to their environment. They might track through space or time. So thinking about range and phenological shifts that are very well documented and often observed. But what we've been focusing on is this interaction of plasticity and evolution. So we can have a varying slope of plasticity that's going to influence basically how much space there is between the current phenotype and the optimal phenotype for selection to act on. So uh, through this conference, we've talked a lot about plasticity and evolution, plasticity's multiple roles. So generally, depending on the slope of this plasticity relationship, we can have plasticity slowing evolution by weakening selection. Alternatively, we can see plasticity enhancing evolution by enabling persistence and maintaining genetic variance. And we've been particularly looking at those roles in the context of environmental variability. So the main approach that we've been using is to use a lot of different empirical data to parameterize a mechanistic model. So briefly, we take climate data, we translate that into microclimate, we couple that with phenotypic data, run that through a biophysical model to estimate body temperature in a given environment. We can then use lab estimates of the temperature dependence of performance to predict performance in the given environment, and then we can use key elements of performance that influence survival and fecundity to, to predict fitness and demography. We can run that model across grid cells to look at demography across landscapes and distribution. So we've been focusing again on these Colorado butterflies. And I want to thank a number of members of our lab that have collected a lot of the field and lab data and NSF for funding. And we're going to be focusing today on Coleus erythroli, the subalpine species that has at least two generations. We've done most of our modeling along this elevation gradient by Niwot Ridge. And I'm going to briefly mention this high elevation species, Coleus medii, today that only has a single generation. OK, so let's walk through this mechanistic model we've been working on for Coleus to integrate from phenotype to fitness. So at a given elevation, we use gridded climate data. We run microclimate models to then translate to the climate relevant to organisms. We use lab estimates of development time as a function of temperature to estimate development rates. That also gives us estimates of phenology. I'm not going to spend much time talking about phenology today. We do see some extent of tracking, but these environments are so variable that it doesn't look like environmental tracking through phenology is likely to play a big role in terms of mediating the interaction of plasticity and evolution. So once we know phenology, we can predict pupil temperature. And we can then uh, shift to thinking about our focal trait. So we're looking at the wing absorptivity of these butterflies. They either have dark melanic scales or light pteridine pigmented scales on um, the underside of their wings. So these butterflies are closed winged baskers. They're orienting relative to the sun to either heat up so that they can function or to avoid overheating. So we use existing patterns across the landscape at the beginning of our study period to parameterize the model in terms of absorptivity. And that allows us to predict adult body temperature using that energy budget biophysical model. We're really interested in absorptivity as a phenotype because it has an interesting role at both chronic and acute time scales. So these butterflies need to warm up sufficiently to be able to fly. We can measure that relationship um, shown on the top there. And flight time is really important for these butterflies because they lay eggs singly on host plants. So empirically, we know there's a good relationship between how long they can fly and their ability to lay eggs. And so chronically, 
dark wings allow them basically to heat up sufficiently by absorbing more radiation, allows them to fly and lay their eggs. But there's all this, also this acute response to absorptivity. So once temperatures get sufficiently hot, we can measure this in the lab, we have declines in egg viability. So we combine those acute and chronic influences, and that allows us to predict the number of eggs produced in a given environment at a given time. We can couple that with field estimates of survival to predict fitness rates. The other nice thing for this exploration about absorptivity is that it's also plastic. So we see relationships, this is uh, measured in the lab, where pupil temperature influences the wing absorptivity. When there's warm pupil temperatures, the butterflies won't likely need to warm up as much, so they have a decreased level of absorptivity, less melanin in their wings. So we characterize this as the absorptivity value at 20 degrees Celsius, and we also characterize the slope of this plasticity relationship B. And we don't have a great understanding of the underlying genetics for absorptivity, so we use quantitative genetic models. We look at a variety of absorptivity levels in a given place and time. We compute the optimal absorptivity and the optimal plasticity. We use directional selection gradients to predict response to selection. And we use empirically derived estimates of heritability of about 40%. So in this model, our fitness estimates are feeding back to influence absorptivity, both via evolution and via shifts in that plasticity slope. So we've been working in this system um, quite a while now, and so we have some results along the single elevation gradients for our models. So high elevation sites are at the top here. And what we see predominantly is that environmental variation plays a big role. We have seasonal variation both between years and within the season that really causes tons of fluctuation in the selection gradient, and that's really slowing down evolution. We also see temporal shifts when we're looking over recent decades in terms of the direction of selection. So we see a lot of initial selection for wing darkening that we predict basically to capitalize on these expanding potential activity times with recent climate change, but in more recent times, we our models are generally predicting a shift to selection for wind lightning to avoid overheating, particularly at low elevation. So to look at our predictions here, um, darker, this is data from 19, or predictions for 1960 in blue to um, 2010 in red. On the right is without plasticity. And at most sites, we're predicting relatively modest shifts in absorptivity. On the left, we've added plasticity in and what you see is that particularly in low elevation, the evolution of plasticity we think can play a big role in facilitating evolution. Um, at low elevation, they actually have a very extended season, so that allows for a lot of realized environmental variability and the ability to use plasticity to buffer that seasonal change um, greatly facilitates evolution in our model. So um, we've finally made it through this modeling exercise to be able to run this model at biogeographic scales and into future environments. So we are uh, looking across the state of Colorado, and remember uh, the Rocky Mountains go from lower left here to upper right. So our first hypothesis was that we thought plasticity would continue to facilitate evolution at this biogeographic scale. And now we're looking into the future. We're looking um, up to 2100. So we expect temporal shifts in this trade-off between more than increasing fitness by extending activity time and decreasing fitness due to overheating. So we're running this model at a daily um, resolution. We're modeling each generation from 1950 to 2100. We're using a mid-range warming scenario, RCP6, and we're applying our model to one eighth degree latitude longitude grid cells. So let's start out by looking at our predicted fitness patterns for the second generation. So we can look um, with increasing elevation and then through increasing time on the x-axis, areas that we predict to have greater fitness are depicted in red here. So if we have constant absorptivity, we're basically predicting that fitness is shifting up the mountain. So we have areas of high fitness at low elevation in the beginning of our time period, and that shifts upward with warming. We can um, then look at the role of evolution. 
So here we have a map of absorptivity up top between 2010 and 2040, so average over that future time period. Areas in blue are where evolution, we predict, are making rings darker. Areas in red are where evolution is making rings lighter. So contrary to what we would predict at the outset, we see a lot of blue there. So that's basically consistent with this trajectory where we have initial evolution to become darker to extend flight time, but then ultimately there becomes a risk of overheating with more warming. And that's what we see in the bottom, bottom panel here. Areas are in red are where evolution decreases fitness over the scenario without evolution. So usually when we're thinking about evolution and climate change, we're thinking, can evolution act fast enough to play a role in response to climate change? And this, to our surprise, um, this model is predicting sort of a new twist on this. We think evolution will be important, but we're projecting that evolutionary lags will follow from the shifts in the direction of selection. And these evolutionary lags may ultimately so let's look at the scenario on the right where we allow the evolution of plasticity. So now we have more red areas where evolution has made wings lighter. So we do see plasticity facilitating evolution at this broad biogeographic scale. If we look at fitness on the bottom, we do see more blue areas where evolution is increasing fitness, but we still have a lot of evolutionary lags that are decreasing fitness. So plasticity is serving to decrease these evolutionary lags. Very briefly, um, one way we've tried to test our model is by looking at museum specimens of this higher elevation species, Coleus medii. And we do see this wing darkening through time at our high elevation site. We see wing lightening through time at lower elevation, I should say, rather than sites regions, but essentially um, this idea of shifts through time and space in terms of the direction of selection is um, upheld when we're looking at museum specimens. And so in conclusion, um, we think evolution is going to really interact with plasticity, and plasticity's primary role is going to be in mediating environmental variability. And to our surprise, our models are suggesting that evolution might actually impose fitness costs due to these temporal shifts from selection for wing darkening to extend flight time to selection for wing lightening to avoid overheating. So uh, this is really a new issue in terms of thinking about the role of evolution in climate change, we think, um, in these types of montane environments. Um, and plasticity uh, in this model can reduce evolutionary lags by facilitating create evolution. So um, thank you. And we are involved in a number of uh, computational projects to try to think about translating environmental change into organismal responses. So um, if anyone's interested in those types of initiatives, please uh, talk to me. Thank you. plans to look at um, correlated traits and if pleiotropy starts to get involved here? Um, we have some plans. So we've looked at a number of thermal regulatory traits, and they are all shifting um, fairly well together. Um, probably the biggest area where we uh, would like to think more about correlated traits is thinking about the evolution of plasticity and the trait itself. Um, so we have actually done historic lab repeats. Uh, we actually don't see the evolution of plasticity. We think there's probably some evolutionary constraint acting, and it might be due to that correlation. Yeah. Um, so either here or elsewhere, we'd love to dive more into the genotypic basis of these 